Y'all want to go ahead and turn in your Bibles, Mark chapter 6, Mark chapter number 6, as they're headed to Children's Church. Uh, you know, we've been walking through the book of Mark. Now, last week I, I went with uh, the book of Daniel, and we talked about that, but uh, we've been walking through the book of Mark, and uh, we're going to talk about here in chapter 6, and chapter 6 is actually a kind of longer chapter of the book of Mark, um, but part of what's in the middle there, we I preached on back in January where he fed the 5,000. And, uh, and I'll be honest, I just wanted to jump ahead to where he walks on water. So this morning we're going to talk about walking on some water. But before we do that, there was something right here in verses 3 through 5. Uh, I just wanted y'all to see. Um, Jesus has come into his hometown. And as he's coming to his hometown... Uh, they make mention of him, and there are kind of some people there kind of looking at him like, who, who is this? What makes this guy so special? Why are y'all making such a big deal? Because Jesus is here. As a matter of fact, look what it says in Mark chapter 6, verse 3. It says, Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and, John, and Joseus and Judah and Simon? He says, And are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. And then the Bible says, But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, and among his own kin, and in his own house. And he could there do no mighty work, save that he had laid hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. Notice how uh, Jesus, he's come into town, and they recognize him right off the bat. But one thing you've got to remember about Jesus, for 30 years, he was just an average guy. All right. Now, we know he was the Son of God, but he didn't live like it. All right. Not saying he sinned. We know he didn't. He was perfect without sin. But the thing was, he did not show that he was the Son of God. It wasn't until he surrendered to the calling that God had put on his life, his Father had put on his life. <coughs> And when John the Baptist baptized him, remember what the Bible says? The Bible says that at that time the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove. All right? And it's at that point when he began his ministry. But before that, for 30 straight years, what was he? A carpenter. Just an average guy. Just a, a carpenter guy. And so when he comes home, everybody says, oh, there's Jesus. Ain't seen him in a while. You know? And here's the thing. Um, notice how it said, Jesus makes a point of this. He says, uh, in verse 4, he says, And Jesus said, A prophet is not without honor. All right, in the Old Testament, any time you had a prophet, John the Baptist was even considered one. Um, but any time you had a prophet of any sort, they were considered very honorable. All right, and they deserved a lot of respect. As a matter of fact, there was a time there where there wasn't any prophets. And the children of Israel were scared to death. And they were like, we need a prophet, somebody we can go to, all right? Somebody that can translate God to us, all right, and, and speak God to us. We need that. A prophet was considered someone with a lot of honor, all right? He was highly sought out in the community. But Jesus is not. See this right here? Jesus even says a point to that. He says, a prophet is not without honor, except in his own country and amongst his own kin and his own house. You know, when I walk around, a lot of y'all, y'all say, my preacher's here, preacher's here, preacher's here. When I go home, they say, Jonathan's here. <laughs> I'm Jonathan to them, you know. I'll always be Jonathan. For 30-something years, I was Jonathan. I, I, you know, I might die, uh, and I hope and pray I do, die a, a well-known preacher. But to a lot of them, I'll just be known as Jonathan because that's what I've always been known as. And something that I think has happened right here, and this is what I don't want y'all to miss before we move on. Notice verse 5. It says, And he could there do no mighty work. Y'all see that? He could do no mighty work. Why is that? And I'll tell you why. They took him for granted. They took him for granted. It's not that Jesus didn't want to do Great works in his home. Of course he did. You know, I've heard a lot of professional athletes say they want to go back home so they can win a championship 
for home because maybe their home team had never won a championship before. And they wanted to be like a hometown hero, right? And, and finally do it for home. And Jesus comes home wanting to do great and mighty works, but He can't because they won't give Him any respect of who He is. As a matter of fact, think of it like this. Jesus has now walked into this town and He says, I cannot do any mighty works. Why couldn't He? And here's why. Because every time He healed somebody, what did He say? Your faith has made you whole. But they didn't believe in Him. They didn't trust Him. It's just like all the rest of the Jews. Um, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin and, and any other Jew. Uh, the Romans, if they would have believed in Him instead of crucify Him, oh, what He could have done. He said to the Jews, He said, I come amongst my own people. John chapter 1. I come amongst my own people. And they received Me not. They didn't want Him. They didn't respect Him. They didn't treat Him with the respect and honor that He deserved. And then I got to thinking about this. I was like, man, this is really sad. It's almost heartbreaking to know Jesus has come home and He's not even, no big deal. Nobody cares. All, think about all that He has been doing. Think about the multitudes that follow Him. And think about He returns home, can do the same thing, and yet they won't believe in Him. They won't trust Him. They won't follow Him in multitudes at home because they don't trust in Him like everywhere else. And then I got to thinking about this. How does that translate to us? Do y'all know we live in an area called the Bible Belt? You don't believe me? Go out these doors and turn left, right, forward, straight. I don't care. Go any direction within five miles, you will run into about ten churches. Amen. Listen to me. In my personal opinion, this is the greatest place on the face of the earth, the southeast United States. In my personal opinion. It's hot, amen. We got heat 10 months out of the year. But it is the greatest place. Because let me tell you something else. It is one of the most God-fearing areas of the world. The world. You go to other parts of the United States, and I'll tell you what people have told me. They've been um, in the military, and they've been shipped all over this great country. They've been shipped all over the world. And they will tell you there's no place like right here. In the southeast United States. You will not find as many Bible-believing, God-fearing churches like you find right here. If you're not in church around here, that, that is no excuse. There's plenty of churches, plenty of options around here. But you know, they say they go out west or up north and there just aren't that many good churches. My own cousin told me that. She said uh, she's married to a guy that's in the Army. They're, they had been here at Fort Benning for a while. She said it felt so good to get back here when we could get in some real good churches again. And there's some out there. They're just far and few. Not like here where they're on every street corner. But, you know, I got to looking at this. And I thought to myself, you know, I'm, and I'm just as guilty as anybody. I feel like we take God's word for granted sometimes. Think about this for a minute. We have always had church. We have always had the Word of God. And yet we don't dig into it and use it like we could. We don't utilize this great resource that God has given us. And therefore, this is why... Listen what he says. He cannot do mighty works in our lives because we take it for granted. We forget how good God has been to us. Because He's always been good to us. He has always blessed us. And you know, it takes getting on an airplane and flying overseas and, and seeing another country like a Guatemala or other countries and realize, I can't wait to get back home. And we're so on fire for God, and then we fizzle back out over time again because we just take it for granted. You know, I heard so many people during the COVID outbreak when everything was shut down, I can't wait to get back to church. And then we said, hey, the church is open and nobody come. <laughs> we take God's Word and what God's done for us for granted so many times. And then listen to me. And look what Jesus is saying. And He can't do mighty works in our lives. Listen to me, I, I'm, I'm not staying there long. Matter of fact, I'm ready to turn. But I, I don't want y'all to miss 
what God has done for us. And I don't want you to miss church and the Word of God and the Wednesday night Bible studies and other things and take it for granted. Let me tell you something. There is a lot of people in this world that would give anything to have a God-fearing, Bible-believing church that they could call home. Amen? And listen, we got it around here, praise God. But don't ever take it for granted. And listen, don't ever think that God don't want to do mighty works in your life. But you have been so blessed for so long. You know what you do a lot of times? You quit really trusting in Him. Like we should. Like we could. And, and I feel like sometimes we don't get the mighty blessings that we could because of that. Matthew chapter 14. I, listen, I, I could carry on over there in Mark when we're talking about walking on water. But like I told you in the beginning, Mark is short, sweet, to the point. He ain't like your preacher, long-winded. Amen. I don't need no amens right there. But, uh, but listen, Mark uh, don't really, he leaves out some of the detail. I think Matthew does a much better job where Jesus walks on the sea. So we're going to read this story out of the book of Matthew. But as, as we're going through this, I, I hope to show y'all something right here that will hopefully change your perspective on maybe some ways you're going through life right now. Let's read, though, from verse 22 all the way down to verse 33. We'll have it up on the screen behind me. And then we're going to go back and we're going to talk about it. Everybody there, say amen. 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 Let's read. The Bible says, And straightway Jesus constrained His disciples to get into a ship and to go before Him unto the other side, while He sent the multitudes away. And when He had sent the multitudes away, He went up into a mountain, apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, from, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter came down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him, and saith unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth thou art. The Son of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. Lord, thank you so much for the singing this morning. Lord, thank you in the eye of the storm. Lord, you were calm. Lord, you were right there with us. Lord, thank you for these red letters, Lord, that have changed our lives. Lord, the, the words of wisdom, of knowledge, of truth that you have given us, Lord, even today. And Lord, your word stands true like never before. Lord, we love you. And Lord, I just pray now that this word speaks to someone here today. Lord, I hope it helps someone today. But most of all, Lord, I pray that you get all the praise and honor and glory. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Notice right here, Jesus has sent the disciples away in a ship. And He goes up onto the mountain and He's praying. Alright? And the disciples by this time have now drifted out way out into the middle of the sea. Alright? And Jesus just all of a sudden takes it upon himself to just start walking across the sea. And he shows up in, in a, such a manner that it scares them to death. But think about this for just a minute. First of all, you ever been woke up in the middle of the night? Huh? And, and you're trying to clear your eyes, you're like... And you, you, you know, you're trying to see what's going on. I, I'm going to tell you something. Well, one of the worst things in the world is to be scared or woke up in the middle of the night, right? And I can just imagine these disciples. Listen to what it says. It says, in, in the middle of the night, it says about the fourth hour. Look on verse 25. It, 
In the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. In verse 26, and when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out with fear. In other words, they thought they had seen a ghost. And they cried out with fear. And guess what? So would you and me. Amen. Let me tell you something. If you think you see a ghost, whoo, you know what I mean? It will make the hairs. Stand up. You didn't even know you had. Amen. Listen, it is nothing like being woke up. And I can imagine they're, they're dozing off a little. They're tired. They're drifting, you know, in the boat. It's kind of rocking them to sleep. And, and maybe they're sitting there and like, is that what I think it is? And it's, all of a sudden they realize and think they see a ghost. And they get scared to death. And you know this because Jesus has to calm them down. He has to come and say, look, it's okay. It's okay, it's just me. Now, I want to tell you something. When you look at this, do you really ask yourself, or have you thought about this for a minute? Think about this for a minute. Now, we love this story. We talk about this story. We preach this story. You know, we teach it to the kids. This is an awesome story. But think about it for just a minute. Why is Jesus doing this? You ever thought about that? He goes in the ship with them everywhere they go. Multiple times he has gotten into the ship and gone wherever they're going. As a matter of fact, we we read one just a couple weeks ago where he's laying down there asleep and the storm comes up and they get scared in and have to wake him up saying, calm the storm. All right. Why did Jesus all of a sudden choose to not go in the ship with him? Why is he walking on the side of the sea? But let me tell you this about Jesus. There's so many times in your life where you don't realize it, but Jesus is teaching you. Jesus is preparing you. You don't realize it, but Jesus is working. Let me show you what happened right here. There's a few guys on this ship. Peter, James, and John. And, and all the other disciples. What were they doing just a few months ago? Fishing. What were they doing for their regular life? Working a regular job. And all of a sudden, this man named Jesus just shows up one day. And he says, hey, follow me. And the Bible says they dropped everything they were doing. And they followed him. But here's the thing. Were they ordained, ready to preach? Not even close. As a matter of fact, Jesus had just started His ministry at this same time. And here's what I believe with all my heart He was doing. Let me tell you what happened to your boy, to your preacher. When I was 17 years old, I've told you all over and over and over, I felt like God was calling me to preach. And I ran. And I was scared to death, and I ran. And for so many years, I ran from God, even to the point, like I've told you, our church kind of divided, and I found myself, for the first time in my life, out of church. And I'm going to tell you something. It was an eerie feeling. It was a weird time. It was not a good time either. And God has this thing, this sense of humor. But he also has ways of making you do things that you normally wouldn't do. See, I was content with putting all my money into my retirement. I was content with getting up, working every day. But I will say this, I was miserable. Deep down in my heart, I was miserable. I couldn't put my finger on it. I bought things. I, I done things. I'd go, we'd go places for vacations. But I was miserable. And I could not figure out why. When deep down I knew in my heart I was running from God. And all of a sudden, I've told you I got put with a man by the name of Blaine Satterfield. Blaine is a brand new Christian. I am a hard burnout Christian. As a matter of fact, I tell people all the time, I was like a little pilot light. I was lit. Y'all know the pilot light in your heater. 
I was lit, but it don't do no good. Amen. It don't put off no light. It don't put off no heat. But you ain't dead either. That was me. That was my life. And all of a sudden, I get put with this man that is a brand new Christian. And he's like a two-year-old that's done ate a bunch of candy. He's hyper. You know what I mean? And he's constantly wanting to ask all these Bible questions. And I'm like, I don't want to answer them. I want to be left alone. And he's just constantly picking and prodding and asking questions. And listen, I'm not knocking blame. I love that man with all my heart. It was me at this time. It was where I was in my walk at this time. I was not in a good place. The Spirit was in me. Jesus was in me. The, uh, the Lord loved me. But I had become cold and hard to the Lord. And to talk about Him at this time in my life was not something I wanted to do. And Blaine just kept asking and kept talking and kept going. And then even to the point, y'all listen to this. Show you how God has a sense of humor. 2008, the economy crashed. And all of a sudden, work, a couple years later, starts getting slow. And I tell y'all, I got to go down to Warner Robins, Georgia, and I got to work. And Blaine comes to me, and he says, Jonathan, he says, if you want to keep a job, he says, I can take you down there. I know it's two hours for you, and I Google mapped it every way you could. Two hours. No matter what, two hours. And I said, well, I want to keep a job. And he says, well, you can go to my house and ride with me, and then we'll ride on down. See, so you ain't got to drive the full two. You can just ride an hour with me. I said, okay, yeah, that works great. I got up every morning at 3 o'clock in the morning. I left the house. I didn't get home till 8, 9, 10 o'clock at night. Oh, and by the way, he said, oh, it probably won't last about six months. I said, okay, yeah, that don't sound bad at all. Four years later, four years later, I'm driving two hours one way. Y'all, it was so bad. I would get home at 8, 9, 10 o'clock at night. Sometimes Amy would call me and I'd say, are you coming home? I was like, I don't know, I'm trying to. I would even get a motel down there every once in a while to sleep just so I could get a night's sleep because you don't get no sleep like that and running like that. But let me tell you what would happen. I would get in the truck with Blaine. And he had it on good old J93, the Joy FM. Y'all know what I'm talking about. And guess what? Focus on the family with Dr. James Dobson would come on. And he's just going to tell you how your life can be so much better and so much more wonderful, right? And then it just rolls right on into Dr. Charles Stanley. Amen. And every morning, I'm getting in this truck. And let me tell you the other thing. Blaine is like a polar. We call him a polar bear. So he's over there running the air conditioner, 100 to nothing. I'm freezing, so I can't sleep. And you know, I used I could go to sleep and sleep through all this. I can't sleep. I got the opposite of hell at this point, amen? And I'm freezing to death, and I'm having to listen to this, and I just want to reach up and turn that radio off and just like, stop! You know, this is where I'm at in my life. But you know, God has, like I said, a sense of humor. And God will put things in your life to wear you down. And that's what he was doing. And I'll never forget it as long as I live. I'm riding with Blaine every single day. See, y'all might complain about having to go to church just one time a day. I was getting church seven days a week. Every single day I was getting church, whether I wanted it or not. Amen. I was getting more church. And I, God had made me start catching up for all that I missed. That's what it was. I just realized it. He was making me catch up. See, you ain't going to get over on God. And I was, I, was, I was miserable, but all of a sudden, let me tell you what started happening. He started chipping away at that heart. And boy, he was chipping hard. And then one day he chipped and you ever hit something on your tooth and you're like, whoo, you know, you bite down and it hits that sensitive spot. That's what happened. He chipped one day and it hurt and it got my attention. And let me tell you who it was. It was Charles Stanley. And this is exactly what he said. I'll never forget it as long as I live. I was probably 32, 33 at this time. Charles Stanley said, give God. The best years of your life. 
He said, don't wait till you're 60, 70, 80 years old. You're retired. And he said, well, I ain't got nothing better to do. I guess I'll go work at the church and give God my life. He said, give God the best years of your life. And all day long at work, y'all, I'm sitting there. And I'm looking at my life. And I thought to myself, who am I? What am I? I live at work. I don't even get to see Amy and the kids. I sure can't, I don't go to church like I should because one thing, I can't get home on Wednesday nights in time because I'm working myself to death. And Sundays, I'm probably sleeping through half the sermons because I'm so tired. What am I doing? What am I giving God? And I wrestled with it all day long. Get back in the church or truck with Blaine that afternoon, listen to some more Christian music and stuff. All. And I get out of his truck and I get in my car. And y'all ever had that moment where you get in your car after a long, hard day or the Lord's really working on you and you start driving and you're kind of like an autopilot? You don't even know how you're going, where you're going. You're hitting blinkers. I mean, you're, you're functioning, but you don't even see nothing. You're like in tunnel vision. That was me. I'm driving home, and I'm just talking to God. And all of a sudden, I said, God, I am sorry. And I just break out crying. I mean, I'm bawling like a baby. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. And I'm bawling. I even to the point I can't even drive and I just pull that car and I just cry for 30 minutes. Good thing a police officer didn't come by. He put me in jail. Thought I had a nervous breakdown. And I just begged God. I said, God, whatever you want me to do, wherever you want me to go, here I am. I'm sorry. Right? And all of a sudden, at this point in my life, all of a sudden, I'm like old Peter and I'm like, all right, all right, God, I'm ready. What you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? I'm ready to preach. I'm ready to teach. And he's like, hold up. Slow your roll, son. <laughs> Calm down. Let's pump the brakes. You ain't ready yet. You see right here, Peter and these disciples, they're not ready yet. There's times in your life where God is trying to teach you because he's preparing you for something way bigger. You see, I surrendered my life, and all of a sudden I'm like, all right, God, let's do this. And God said, hold on, pump the brakes. You're not ready yet. Look what he happens right here. He comes up to these disciples. You think, man, this is weird. He, why is he walking on the water in the middle of the night? It is one of the greatest learning lessons ever. Look what happens. The Bible says, and when the disciples saw in verse 26, and when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it is a spirit, and they cried out in fear. But straightway, Jesus spoke unto them, saying, be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. You know, I love that about Jesus. He's always telling us, be not afraid. Be not afraid. Quit, don't get scared. Don't get up. Be not afraid. And then look right here in verse 28, Peter. Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And Jesus, right here, he could have said, no, you're not ready yet. But no, what did he do? Come. Come on, Peter. Yeah, absolutely. At least one of y'all is getting what I'm trying to do here. Come on. And the Bible says, as Peter walks out onto the water, He steps out of the ship and he begins to walk onto the water. Now, I'm going to tell you, that's cool. I don't care who you are, that is pretty cool. Matter of fact, I used to joke about my brother. He wears a size 16 shoe and then you come along. What do you wear, 20? A size 20, y'all. That boy, he ought to look like an ale. Amen. I mean, that is massive. Size 20. And uh, I, I used to joke with my brother, though, and say he's the first person since Jesus can walk on water, and then Keith comes along. Amen. But with them, you think they got skis on the bottom of their feet. And, but just think about that. Have you ever tried to walk on water? I have. I ain't even going to lie. I'm that dumb. All right, I tried. 
Uh, matter of fact, I was at the swimming pool. And I said, you know, ever done one of them deals where you kind of run up and you do the tap, tap real quick, trying to, trying to go real fast, but you don't really want to put no weight down on it? All right, that's what I said I was going to do. All right, 200 pound me is going to run across the pool by a good two or three steps and get to this. I already had, I said, man, I can do this. And I take off and run it. And I went tap, loop right to the bottom. <laughs> Sunk like a lead weight. Amen. There ain't no tapping on water to me. But to see, I, man, I would love to be able to do this. What Peter did, he steps out of the boat. And he begins to walk on the water. That's cool. I'm telling you, that is pretty cool. Don't think this didn't get the disciples' attention. You see, that's the thing about Jesus too. He would use things and lessons that they never forget. All right? And so, you you ain't going to forget walking on water, I promise you. And Peter walks on this water. And then notice what happens. Verse 30. But when he saw, you see this right here? But when he saw, you need to highlight under that, under he saw. Because there's, that's when he messed up. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. Let me tell you something. When you take your eyes off Jesus, you're going to be afraid. I don't care where you're at. When you take your eyes off of Jesus, you are going to be afraid. Let me tell you, have you ever noticed on a horse, they will put them, uh, what are them things called? Um, huh? Bi- bl- blinders? Is that right? All right, that's simple enough. Blinders! All right, here we go. They put in blinders on a horse. Why? Because they want that horse to focus on where it's going and nowhere else. Do y'all know we used to have covered bridges? Some of y'all have seen our covered bridges. Uh, There's not many left anymore. They've they've got rid of all of them. Why did they used to have covered bridges? You try to take a horse across a bridge, it ain't covered and see what happens. Amen. That joker's going to freak out. Let me tell you something. When you take your eyes off Jesus, you're going to freak out. You're going to get scared. You're going to get nervous. All the corruption of the world is going around, on around us. It always has and it always will. You better keep your eyes on Jesus. Because let me show you what happens when you don't. Look what happens. Verse 30. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. Everybody say sink with me. Sink. You're going to start sinking in life when you take your eyes off Jesus. Y'all hear me? You better keep your eyes fixed on the main man, and that's Jesus. Because if you don't, life will overwhelm me. You know something else I love about this? It says Jesus is walking on top of the water. Let me tell you something. The thing that was designed to drown me and you, He's way above. Amen? I love how in that one song, and I can't remember which one it is, um, but it says, Since when has the impossible ever stopped you? Amen. Impossible has never stopped our Lord. He, amen, he thrives when everybody says it's impossible. He says, oh, watch me. Watch me go to work. Watch me show you. Listen to me. He's doing the impossible. We sink in this thing called life when we take our eyes off Him. But as long as we got our eyes fixed on Him and our faith on Him, we're going to do things that seem impossible to everybody else. But notice He begins to sink. And while He's sinking, have you ever noticed when you're, you're in trouble, you start praying? Amen. You want to pray, and you start praying, and then you want to know what exactly to pray because you need the prayer to be specific, right? Amen. Well, let me tell you something. But then there's sometimes in life when you're sinking too fast. And this is what you need to do. Lord, save me. That's what he did. Y'all notice that right there? It wasn't no long, drawn out, beautiful prayer. You ever heard somebody, you're like, man, I wish I could pray like that. You know what I mean? It ain't like that right here. It's Lord, save me. That's all he said. Because let me tell you something. It ain't about the length of the prayer. It's about the strength of the prayer. Amen. Sometimes in life, you just need to pray, praise God. You need to just trust and you need to pray and you need to say, help me, Jesus. And He knows exactly what you need. 
The Bible says he knows what we pray, what we need before we even pray it. The Bible also says over in Romans chapter 8, it says that uh, the, in times where we don't even know what to say, the Holy Spirit will make groanings for us and that are honored so, so that uh, uh, it's praying for us. Listen to me. God will make intercession for you. You don't have to pray no big elaborate prayer. You just, God, I need you. God, help me right here. God, the pain is too real. God, I don't even know what to say. I just need you right now. Listen to me. It's the strength. Of the prayer that matters. Amen. And, 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 and Peter cries out. And what did Jesus do? No, oh boy, you better keep praying. That ain't good enough. I want to hear you pray something better. I want to hear you pray something different. You got to practice your praying right here. No, that ain't what Jesus did. Jesus said, come on. Come on, get on up here. He pulled him right up. He saved him right there. Notice something. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand, verse 31, and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith. Ain't that a common theme when, in, in these Gospels? Either your faith has made you whole, or O thou of little faith. <laughs> it's such a common theme throughout here. I believe what Jesus is trying to show us is everything is based on believing in Him. Trusting in Him. O thou of little faith. Wherefore did thou doubt? Why did you doubt me, Peter? Why did you doubt? Now, i, I got to get back to my story real quick. I surrender my life. I said, all right, God, I'm ready. I'm ready, God. But God says, you're not ready. Okay, you surrendered. You took the biggest step, but you are not ready. Notice when Peter and these disciples surrendered and they followed Jesus. It took three years walking and talking with Jesus every day. And they still denied Him when He died on the cross. And you sit there and think to yourself, Okay, Jesus, I surrender my life. I'm ready. No, you're not. You know, I believe with all my heart, and I, I, I'm going to say this. Some of y'all might laugh and think I'm silly, but I believe there's what you call Jesus University. And we got to graduate sometimes before He's going to give us more. He's going to test you. He's going to teach you. He's going to try you. But until you pass, you don't graduate. Let me tell you what happened. I surrendered my life. I said, all right, God, I'm ready. I'm ready to get out of Warner Robins. <laughs> and I'm ready to be used. Well, let me tell you something. I spent three more years in Warner Robins. Down there. That was four years total. I said three years after this. While I'm down there, he also teams me up with this man that just happens to be a preacher. <laughs> and this man kind of takes me and Blaine under his wing and starts mentoring both of us. And I'm like a sponge. I'm just soaking it up. I've always said I learned as much about the Bible and the Word of God in that little span right there, that two or three year span, than I ever learned in my life. And it's, I think it's because, though, I wanted it more. I wanted it the most. And I dug and, and I searched. And God was feeding me as fast as I could take it in. I come back home. We start working here close to home again. We get in church. True story. Sunday morning, me and Amy in our old church, and it was like these two rows, and then there's two kind of quartered like this, and then two on the sides like this. And this is kind of deep, too. We always sit kind of back there. Back row Baptist, that's what we was. Amen. Back, back in the back left, that's where we sit. Not on the very, very back, but close enough. We was back there in the back corner. Every Sunday, every single Sunday, without fail, that's where we sit. And one Sunday morning, we had a children's thing going on. And Emma and all the rest of the kids are up on the stage that morning. And I'm sitting literally like right here, right here where Sam's at. Never in a million years would I be right there. I'd be right back here. But this Sunday, just because of these kids, we're right here. Amy's taking pictures. I'm helping her, helping get some of the kids straight. Uh, and we're right there. All of a sudden, here comes Aaron McCullough 
of the Truth Baptist Association and sits down right beside me. Brad says, all right, let's shake hands. And I get up and I shake his hand. And he looks at me and he said, boy, don't I know you. And I said, no, sir. I said, but I know you. I said, maybe Brad's mentioned me. I've taught Sunday school around here a few times and he let me preach here and there. I want to see you after church. I said, oh, no. What in the world did I do, Lord? Oh, sir, I don't even know what Brad preached that Sunday morning, y'all. I was scared to death, wondering what in the world this man's fishing do to me, right? Anyways, church was over. I go over to him. He says, I am doing a class for young preachers. You better be there. Yes, sir. <laughs> I go to this class. While I'm in this class, all of a sudden they say, you need to get in Faith Bible Institute. Get in it. And I meet a guy, and he's got a church, and Brother Aaron's got me going all over Troop County preaching at churches. West Point and all over. And this one guy, he says, hey, Jonathan, he says, uh, he says I'm going to be out of town. He said, will you fill in for me? I said, yeah, shoot you. I'd love to come fill in at your church. He said, all right, it's out towards Greenville, Georgia. I said, okay, no problem. That's even close to home. Shoot you, I got you. So I go out there that morning, y'all, and I show up, get there a little extra early, walk in, walk back here to the fellowship hall area, and all of a sudden there's one woman, a guy, and this little kid. I'm sitting there, and we sit there and talk for a little while, and then they break out the Sunday school book, and we have Sunday school. I'm like, okay. I said, well, let's go on in here and have church. We walk into the church. That lady, the guy, and the kid. All right, let's have church. I was like, man, there's three people here. I'm like, I thought he said he had a church for me to preach to, right? There's three people. And you know what? I'm sitting there. I'm like, well, I didn't told him I'd do it now. So I, I preached. 30, 45 minutes. I know y'all think that's a lie. Hour. <laughs> hour later. We had us a good old time. Preaching away. I leave. Thank you. I leave. I get a phone call later that week. Jonathan. Uh, they're in England, by the way. Hey, we hear you did a great job. Uh, can you fill in for me again next week? We're going to be out one more weekend. I'm thinking to myself, man, there was three people there. Just ask them to go visit another church for a week. It ain't going to kill them. You know what I mean? Three people. And see, here's the thing. I'm sitting at home, and I'm like, God, why? Three people. You know what I mean? Why? It was a test. I know now. I didn't then. But he was testing me. He's testing them. He's teaching and he's testing. And all of a sudden I go in there. Guess what? Same three people. Nobody else. I'm like, you couldn't invite a friend. You know what I mean? Same three people. Sunday school, church. You know, preach my heart out. We had a good time. But here's the thing. I don't say, Lord, Lord, what are you doing? What, why? I say, he don't have to tell you why. He just wants to see if you're faithful, number one. You know, I said, anywhere you want me to go, anything you want me to do, I'll do it. And he says, all right, well, let's see. <laughs> and then, you know what happened? It's true. Last year, all of a sudden, everybody was like, I, I want to come back to church. And we open up the church and nobody comes back. And literally one morning, one Sunday morning, I'll never forget it. We were doing the Facebook Live. And all of a sudden, I'm like, y'all, forgive me. I don't know if anybody's going to be here. You know, we don't know, you know. And uh, I said, but there are people watching. I said, just sing your hearts out like, like the place is full. And they're like, well, you're literally preaching to the choir this morning, ain't you? I said, yeah, I guess so. And that was all that was here. But I was like, well, I've been here before, ain't we, Lord? But here's, here's the thing. God just wants to test you. God wants to try. You know, sometimes in life right now, God is testing you. God is teaching you. You know, I love that song by Micah Tyler where he says, you know, I, I had to, I prayed for years and years and years. I'm like, God changed this situation around me. But then he realized, God, what I really need to pray is what are you trying to show me? What are you trying to teach me? Let me tell you something, y'all. 
some of the things I experienced in that time is some of the greatest lessons I ever learned to come here. I could not have done some of the things I've done and, and he prepared me for here. Y'all know, I ain't never been to no seminary. Y'all know that. Y'all got a dummy up here. Y'all don't know if y'all realize that yet. But listen, I have never been trained to be a preacher. I never. I don't know what I'm doing. Can y'all tell? Good. Just keep listening in. I just, listen, I just love the Word of God. And I just love talking about the Word of God and what His Word's meant to me in my life. And, and look, God, but what, I've run, what I have learned and what I learned especially from the time I surrendered was how God began to teach me things. You know, when Mom died, Mom died in March. I came down, March 2017, I came down here September 2017. I had never experienced death like that before in my life. I had never experienced pain like that before in my life. And yet I've sat and cried with so many of y'all. Because I know what you're going through. God was teaching me. And I didn't realize it at the time. This past week, when we got that phone call about Mildred, that's exactly what happened with my mama. And let me tell you something. What used to would have devastated me has now shown me she went the best way there was. You go to sleep and you wake up in glory, praise God. Let me tell you something. God is teaching you in life right now. You know what? What Peter didn't realize? His biggest challenge was ahead. Jesus is teaching him right here. Jesus is saying, Peter, I've got huge plans for you, buddy. The best is yet to come, I promise. But you've got, you got some lessons you've got to learn first. You've got to go through some things First, Peter. Do you know this is the same Peter that just a couple chapters later, Jesus is going to be sitting around with all the disciples. And he says, who do you say that I am? And they say, well, some say you're Elijah. Some say John the Baptist reincarnated and some others prophets. Jesus says, but who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ. You see, Peter started finally realizing who he was and the power that lived in him. But then the greatest challenge was still to come. What did Peter do when Jesus died? Jesus said, Peter, you're going to deny me three straight times. You're going to deny me, Peter. But Peter, don't give up. Don't quit. It's going to be okay. And then Jesus comes back three days later. You think Peter was scared to see Jesus? You better believe it. I would be too. But let me tell you what happened. What did he say? Peter, I love you. Peter, I love you. Peter, I love you. Go feed my sheep. And from that moment on, let me tell you what happened to Peter. He graduated Jesus University. But could you know what he done just a few days later on the day of Pentecost? He preached and just some 3,000 something people got saved. And then he goes on boldly from then on out. You know, he lived scared and afraid while Jesus was alive. But the minute Jesus ascended up on the Mount of Olives and said, Go teach and preach the gospel, you don't find scared Peter anymore. He lived boldly. And I guarantee Peter looks back on the day he walked on the water and the day he began to sink. And when he's getting beat and he's getting tried and he's going through all these tribulations, he said, Don't worry, boys, just keep your eyes on Jesus. They can't sink us. We'll be okay. He was training him. He was teaching him. The best was yet to come to Peter. Let me tell you something. The best is yet to come to me and you. You just don't realize what God's trying to teach you because you've been fighting him. Why don't you start trusting him? Quit doubting him. I love how he asked Peter, why did you doubt me? You know, I could say the same thing about my life. Why have I doubted him? Think about that for a minute. How many of you have ever worried then you doubted him. <laughs> when you start doubting, then you doubt the power that lives inside of you. You know that? Greater is he that is within me. Help me, Miss Hilda. She done gone. Then he that's in the Lord. She was back there. Then he that's in the world. Greater is he. Let me tell you something. Quit doubting the power that lives inside of you. Look at, look at what God's doing in your life at this moment. And you say, Lord... 
I do not understand what you're doing, but Lord, I believe with all my heart you are teaching me and you're preparing me because you have got bigger, better things ahead of me. And Lord, I want to see. Lord, I don't want to miss a thing. I want to see what you're doing in my life. Because let me tell you all something. When I finally surrendered, right after mom died, I had surrendered my life and I went through all that stuff and then I begged God to, to make me a preacher. <laughs> and then just a few months later, guess what? Y'all come a-calling. Huh? And let me tell you, I got this whole other story. Y'all they had 200 applications sitting there and they chose me. You're welcome. <laughs> 200! <laughs> When they told me that, I'm like, what in the world? What made y'all pick me, you know? But let me tell you something. It wasn't them and it wasn't me. It was Him. God was preparing me for y'all and y'all for me. You know what I mean? I, and look, uh, and He ain't done yet. You know, I've learned a lot in the last four years. A lot. I'm constantly learning. I'm like... Whoa, Lord, why didn't you show me that before? I could have used that a long time ago, you know. But he said, you weren't ready for it. Listen to me. I don't know why you're where you're at. I don't know why you're going through what you're going through or why what's going on around your life, what's going on. Put your eyes on him. And say, Lord, whatever you're teaching me right here, I don't want to miss it. Because, Lord, I know your word is true and I know the best is yet to come for me, for my life, for my family. Lord, look where I'm at. Look where I used to be. Look where I'm at. I know. But Lord, I want to see what you're trying to teach me. I want to grow. Amen? Every head bowed, every eye closed. This morning I'll ask the most important question I'll ever ask. Standing right here. If today was your last day on earth, do you know without a shadow of a doubt that heaven would be your home? And if you sit right there today and you say, Brother John, I just don't know. Well, the Bible is very clear that if you will bow your heart and bow your head, confess with your mouth, and believe with your heart, you shall be saved. Listen, it ain't the length of the prayer. It's the strength of the prayer this morning. So right where you sit today, will you pray this prayer with me and believe it? That's the key. Heavenly Father, Lord, I know I am a sinner. And Lord, I'm asking you right now to forgive me of my sin. To come into my heart and save my soul. Lord, I want you to be the Lord and Savior of my life. Nobody looking around, if you prayed that prayer, would you lift your hand? Anybody, anywhere, I'm looking. Praise God. I want to ask a couple questions this morning. First off, I want to ask this. How many of y'all would be willing to say you're sitting there and you have been running from God for a long time. You're fighting. You're hard-hearted. And God's been chipping away at you lately. And He hit you this week or He hit you lately. And it hurt. It hurt really, really bad. And you want to rededicate your life. You want to surrender your life. Like I did that day I pulled my car. Listen, I didn't get saved again when I pulled that car over that day. I just surrendered. I just gave my life to Christ. I was going to heaven. But I was not living where I should have been living all along. In His will. Big difference. And how many of you would say, I have been pricked lately, and it hurt? 
And I want to be in His will. I want to be where God's calling me. How many of you would say, that's me this morning, Brother John? Lift your hand. Let me see your hands. I see those hands. Now my second question is this. How many of you would sit right there and say that you're in a situation in life or you've been in a time in life for the last few months and you've been questioning God, asking why? You, it makes no sense. It don't seem to end. And it's, it's just like, why? And you're asking God constantly. How many of you say, that's me today, Brother Jonathan? I, I'm wondering why. Why won't it quit? Why won't it end? Why can't I get some relief from this? All right, I see them hands. Let me tell you something. I said the same thing. Same thing. Same exact thing. But God had to teach me. I'm a hard-headed student. And I would not listen. And I would not trust Him yet. Listen to me. When God first called me, when I pulled that car over that day, and I said, wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to do, that day before that, there's no way I would have went home and packed up my bags and, and sold my house and everything I had to come down here. You, no way. My heart wasn't ready. My life wasn't ready. I was not ready. But when God got a hold to me, I started getting rid of things. I started getting rid of things that was going to hamper my walk with God. I got my finances to where I could go anywhere. Any And listen, I'm not bragging on me. I'm just telling you. God started teaching me. Like he's never taught me before. And I really believe with all my heart that's what he's doing with you this morning. You've got to open your eyes. You've got to open your heart. You've got to open your spirit. You've got to get out of the flesh for a minute and say, Lord, I don't understand. I don't know what you're doing. But Lord, I surrender. Look, I want everybody to do this. Is there a piece of tissue in front of the pew, in front of you? Grab a piece of tissue. Everybody in here, grab a piece of tissue. Grab a piece of tissue. Everybody, grab a piece of tissue. You got your tissue. Everybody got your tissue. Hold it up. Let me see it. Hold it up. Start waving it. I surrender. Y'all hear me this morning? Say it with me. I surrender. I surrender. Say it like you mean it. I surrender. I surrender, Lord. Me. I surrender. I'm tired of fighting. I'm tired of filling this with tears. I surrender. I surrender this morning. Lord, I'm ready to hear from you. I'm ready to learn from you. I surrender this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you this morning. Lord, I thank you. Lord, this, it, it seems like a weird story when you really read it, Lord. But Lord, I now know because this was me. Lord, you love to teach. You love to make us better. You love for us to trust you. But the Lord, sometimes the only way we're going to trust you is when you teach us. The problem is we don't like to learn always. We just want instant results. But Lord, I know without a shadow of a doubt, Peter did not ever forget this. The disciples did not ever forget this, Lord. And Lord, when the times got tough, when the beatings got real, and Lord, when the Romans uh, started persecuting and the, and the fear and the doubt of everybody else was around, they stood up and they said, don't doubt, don't fear. He is going to help us. They were surrendered to the power of the Holy Spirit and nothing could move them. Nothing could sway them. Nothing could stop them. Lord, that's where I want to be. Lord, COVID, Lord, financial 
breakdowns, Lord. Uh oh family breakdowns, worldly breakdowns. I want to stand on your promises and say I have surrendered to the power of God and nothing can shake me. Nothing's going to shake me because my God has taught me. My God has showed me. Don't doubt Him. Don't fear Him. Trust Him. Believe in Him. Heavenly Father, Lord, we're going to open this altar Lord, I know for a fact there's people in the middle of the test right now, Lord. Lord, they're in the middle of life situations and they can't understand why. Lord, I pray they come down here. Lord, I pray that those lives that want to be rededicated, Lord, I pray they come down here. Lord, I pray they surrender this morning. Lord, I pray they mean it this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody standing. This altar is open. This morning, if you want to give your life to Jesus Christ, you come. If you want to follow in believer's baptism, you come this morning. There is a true order than the ages. There is a promise of things yet to come. There is one born for our salvation, Jesus. is a light that overwhelms the darkness. There is a kingdom that